questions. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, the message is again entitled, Dressed to the Nines. Some of you would probably be looking at me with disapproval because I'm not dressed to the nines. I'm wearing jeans and sneakers. That was to go along with this morning, by the way, the sneaker part. But in all seriousness, what does it mean if somebody is dressed to the nines? Well, you see the picture up here. you got a guy in his tuxedo and his bow tie, and he's, he's all dressed. So somebody says, you are just dressed out. You are all out there. You, you have put on your best clothing. You're looking, maybe we would say it today, maybe not dressed to the nines as much as we might say. You're looking pretty schnazzy. Maybe snazzy is something that old dads say, I don't know. But you, you're complimenting them on their appearance. The, where does that phrase come from? Maybe it's not one that you use very often, but you may have heard it before. It's thought to be Scottish. It, there's a lot of different theories because nobody's exactly sure where did this phrase come from. The one I probably like the most is they say it had to do with bowling. Well, you say, well, bowling, how, do, how does that fit? But today, if you go bowling here in the States, you get one of those big balls with the three holes, and how many pins are down there at the end of the, at, at the, end of the lane? There's 10, okay? Well, back in the day, they didn't always bowl with 10 pins. There was a game called nine pins, right? And so, by the way, on the East Coast, we have candle pin bowling, where I came from. Anybody ever go candle pin bowling? So the, the pins are actually shaped a little bit differently instead of the, the traditional skinny at the top and, and rounded at the bottom. They're, they're, you could actually stack them on either end so they're a little more, more oblong. And you get a, a ball that's about the size of a softball. And instead of getting two attempts, you get three attempts. If you ever go out east, go candle pin bowling. You'll have a good time. All right. But in, in the thought is behind the, the origin of this phrase, it had to do with nine pins. And nine, if you get all nine pins, that's perfection. That's the highest score you can get on a frame. And so maybe it had to do with being dressed to the nines, it, the perfection. Other people have theorized maybe it had to do back in the day when tailors and people would make uh, a lot more of uh, nice garments. They'd go to a tailor to have a custom-made suit instead of buying something off the rack. The thought was that if you're going to make a really good suit and you're going to cut the cloth just so, so the patterns and things line up, and not just putting it together piecemeal, you're going to need about nine yards of cloth to make the perfect suit. And so you're dressed to the nines. Other people th thought maybe it's a reference to scale, that perfection never can be quite attained, but if you're on a scale of 1 to 10 and you can't really quite get perfection, if somebody's hit a 9, that's pretty good. That's about the best you're going to do. Some others have theorized maybe it had to do with an English phrase called, uh, where they said, dress to the eyes. And so it was more like dress to the nines. And it would kind of, in the accent, get a little bit more corrupted to be dressed to the nines. Tying it in with Christianity, some have said maybe it has to do, when you go through the list in Galatians, of the fruit of the Spirit, there are nine different fruits that are listed there. And so maybe that would have had to do with the perfection of the fruit of the Spirit. But we know, whatever else, however else the phrase comes, when somebody compliments you kids, if they say you're dressed to the nines, they're trying to say something positive. They're trying to say that you look nice. You're dressed to perfection. Everything is in place. Everything is presented in the best way possible. As we look at the text this morning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, we see that Adam and Eve were doing their best to dress for the occasion, but their efforts were less than perfect. When they started out, they were not dressed to the nines, but as Moses records as we read our verse, the Lord God made for Adam and Eve and for his wife garments of skins, and clothed them. So, whatever it was they were wearing was inadequate. God had to provide them with the proper attire, the proper clothing. And we see from this passage that God clothes us. God clothes us. That's your first point on your outline. And why does he clothe Adam and Eve? It is, first of all, to cover their shame. And that is the benefit that God gets for us. What were they wearing? 
If you go back to verse 7 in the passage, Moses records this. After they ate of the fruit, then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. One commentator by the name of James Montgomery Boyce says this, We hear people speak of prostitution as the oldest human profession, but they are wrong when they say this. Their view throws light on the guilt with which our contemporaries view many sexual relations, but it is misleading. The oldest of all professions is not prostitution, but the clothing industry. And if you think through it that way, that's exactly right. They came up with all these other things, but in the end, they knew they needed clothing. And what else, what would further go, is that God knew they needed clothing. What they made was inadequate. What God gave them was fitting for the occasion. But God did not say, no, what you're doing is wrong. You don't need that. He just made sure they had what was adequate, what was appropriate for themselves. And why did they need to cover? Because when they sinned, they were aware of what had happened. They were aware of their guilt before God. When God had said, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. And they were trying to cover not only their act up, and how did, had they done that? By running away, hiding from the presence of God, trying to mask it. But they were also aware of each other, their vulnerability, their problems that they had. And there were things that needed to be covered. And so physically, they brought that together. They, they came together with these clothing items, but they were not skilled at it. They were grabbing at whatever they had to try to mask what had happened. And they were aware of their standing before God. They were aware that what God had said, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And they did not like the feelings, the responses and reactions internally that they had to deal with at that point in time. And friends, that's something we need to think about still even today. When we think about our clothing and what are we trying to hide? I'm not trying to say we should put it all out on display. But there is a reminder when we look at what we wear and who we are on the inside, and let's just be frank as well, there's reasons why we wear what we do. Your pastor has made some adjustments, but it's still nice to hide some things with a coat. Up here. <laughs> Just say it. The, the way that we dress, we try to present ourselves in the best possible light. But most of us, friends, don't want to be exposed for everything that we are. Most of us go through great lengths not to show up how we rolled out of bed the first thing in the morning, amen? You take time to comb your hair. You take time to present yourself in as positive a way as possible. Because we know there are things that are there. How many, I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you are here this morning with your natural hair color? <laughs> okay. There's things we're trying to hide. There's things we're trying to mask. And that's part of human experience. I'm not saying it's a wrong thing, but I'm using it as an illustration for us to think through that God sees everything. You are not hiding your age from God. You are not hiding your hair color from God. You're not hiding any more than Adam and Eve were. He knows who you are. He knows what you have done. And he knows that what you deserve. Just like Adam and Eve knew what they deserved. And the next point on your outline is God sees and provides covering. God helps them understand as he is covering their sin with the sacrifice of an animal's life 
There were at least two animals that had to die so that God could skin them and give them adequate covering. It was trading those animals' death for the life that they could now have before God. They were existing with clothing, with something that was more than adequate, something that was appropriate for the occasion. They were trading death for life. This is what God had done, covering their guilt, covering their shame, and helping them understand that, yes, you will surely die, but not yet. I have given you an appropriate relationship with me now. This is how we can stand before each other and have communication. This is how I can show my grace to you. We read this morning from Hebrews chapter 9. We didn't make it all the way down to verse 22 yet. We'll do that, Lord willing, next Sunday. But here's what the author of Hebrews says in verse 22. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We had the context earlier with the blood of bulls and goats, with the blood of those animals that were sacrificed. The children of Israel, the Jewish nation, could have their sins accounted for. As it said there, it was for the priest's sins, for the unintentional sins of the people. This was how God reminded them Something has to die in order for our relationship to exist. In in order for it to happen the way that it should, there must be the shedding of blood. And it reminds us here, friends, as well, that Jesus was the one who shed his blood. Our great high priest doesn't have to shed blood for his own sins. He sheds it on our behalf. He dies so that we might live. Isaiah says this in Isaiah 61 and verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. And why is he rejoicing? For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest, with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. What gives us value? What makes us acceptable and even attractive in the sight of God? As it talks about here, the bride adorning herself with her jewels. We're going to have that very vivid illustration. Many of you are going to see that this weekend, right? And she's going to look beautiful, I'm sure of it, right, Lane? You better say it, Amen. Okay, and that's, that's a picture of what God sees when he sees us. A bride adorned for her husband and friend as part of the church. We are the bride of Christ. And why are we able to stand there in his presence? Because we are clothed in the garments that he's talking about here. We are covered in the righteousness of Christ. And we do not die because of John 3.16. Whoever believes in him will not perish, does not die. Instead, we have eternal life. We have passed from death to life because our sins are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. His death is what atones and brings that separation back together. He bridges the gap. We have made that point several times here going through the book of Genesis, but it's important to see it with the clothing illustration here once again. This is what God does so they can have their relationship. This is what God has done for us so that we could have our relationship with him. And so, friend, what you must do, what we must all do if we want to have that right relationship with God, is to evaluate our wardrobe and discard the futility of trying to dress ourselves with the fig leaves like Adam and Eve. So that's the next point on your outline, evaluating your wardrobe. 
evaluating your wardrobe. You see that the fig leaves were inadequate. God looked at them and says, that will not do. And so, throw those things away. Discard your futility. When we try to cover up our own failures, our own sins, we're just like Adam and Eve, trying to wear a little leaf skirt. It's not adequate. It doesn't do what is necessary. This is what Isaiah says in Isaiah 64, 6 once again. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Many of you are familiar with the King James translation that says, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And listen to what he says here. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Now, he doesn't have necessarily a fig leaf in mind when he says this, but certainly the fig leaf is going to dry up. It's going to wither. It's not going to retain its flexibility for very long. It's not going to be adequate. It's going to blow away. It's not going to be permanent. It's not going to be hardy and withstand the elements like a leather garment would, which is basically what you should envision what God makes for them at this time. But we can try to take what is quickly and easily accessible, what is temporary and fading, and often use that to cover up our failures and our shortcomings. We grab desperately with our own fig leaves as human beings. And so, some of those fig leaves that we might grab to try to hide our sin, to try to hide our failures, might look like doing good deeds, doing good works. Well, you know, I know that I have sinned, I know I have problems, I know I've had issues, but maybe if I can just go and volunteer, do some community service, and get a good reputation with my friends and neighbors, that will make people think, that I'm more than just my, my failures and my youthful indiscretions or even maybe my recent indiscretions. I'm going to try to erase my reputation, repair those things by doing good things. And maybe I can win favor with my neighbors. And more importantly, I can win favor with God that way. And there's more than one person who has done that. Even one particular large gathering of, of, of people that calls itself a church, we call that doing penance. That if I can make restitution somehow, I can go through and do all these good deeds, I will be able to erase the bad deeds that I have done. And yet, what does Paul remind the Ephesians? You have been saved by God's grace through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not of works. We have nothing to boast about. We have nothing to elevate ourselves up with pride. In fact, Paul says in Galatians, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified to me, and I unto the world. It is God's sacrifice of His Son on Calvary's cross on our behalf that gives us that confidence. It's not that works don't matter, but works don't save, friends. It is works, if you are relying on what you do to try to increase your position in standing with God, you're going to fall woefully short. That is why, Paul says in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You try to do good works, some of us might come closer than others, but you're never going to bridge that gap on your own. You're always going to fall short and fall into the chasm of death and separation from God. It's not going to be done by good works. It's not going to be done by religious acts. What we read about this morning in Hebrews chapter 9 portrays this. It's not with the blood of bulls and goats. It's not going through the rituals of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. 
that got anybody into heaven, that repaired their relationship with God? What was it that saved them? We talked about this last week in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, we understand. It is by faith that we have that relationship with God. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. But it comes from God, not from our own actions. And whether it is the Old Testament sacrificial system that they were relying on, their circumcision, or whether it's some of you or your friends and neighbors who are born into a Christian family. You say, why am I going to? Well, because I know I was sprinkled as an infant. I was baptized. And that's how I know. I'm in this, this covenant relationship with God. And that, that's what God is going to look at because I have done these things. I've gone through confirmation. I've adhered to the system. And that's even people outside of this circle. Maybe even some of you would think that, well, I've been coming to this church since my parents brought me out of the, the dispensary. I've been in the nursery. I, I know I, I, my name's been on this roll. I'm a faithful church-going kind of person. And you rely on that kind of a relationship to get you into heaven, to assure you of your standing with God. Because I prayed a prayer with my Awana leader. Because I went to vacation Bible school. Maybe even because I was baptized. And all those things are important. None of those things are why we get into heaven. Paul says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, the new birth, and renewing, not of our own works, but on the Holy Spirit, the garments that Christ provides to us. That's the only thing we can rely on, not our religious acts of the Protestant, the Catholic, or the Baptist varieties. It's not through doing those things that we have assurance. It's not even when people work through addictions, and, and whether it be addictions of behavior or addictions of substance, and I've been able to put those things away from, I'm in recovery. And we have this delusion sometimes that if I can just get victory over these things, if I can stop doing those things, that is what's going to make me a better person. And maybe even that's what's going to improve my relationship with God in that way, by having victory over those things. It's not to say that God doesn't want us to have victory, that he doesn't want the quality of our life to improve, that he doesn't want those destructive habits to be eradicated. But that ultimately for us as human beings is going to be fully and completely the result of a heart change of transformation internally. Yes, friends, there are people who don't know Jesus Christ who have been able to have success and victory over some of those destructive habits. That does not cure the loneliness the vacancy that is in their souls that only God can fill. That does not obscure or cover or eradicate the guilt that is internally. It might improve their human relationships. It might improve even the quality of their temporary life here on earth. But in the scheme of eternity, there is something far greater that must be addressed. We do need to discard our futility, we do need to be dressed in his finery. God must supply the cover for our sins. John the Baptist would recognize this when he saw Jesus coming and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was the sacrifice of the Lamb that would have its blood shed on behalf of the nation of Israel 
that the priest could sprinkle on that mercy seat inside the holiest place that we talked about in Hebrews chapter 9 that would make restitution for the entire nation for the year. Jesus goes in as our great high priest and does not sprinkle the blood of an animal. He offers the Father His own blood and offers it on behalf of all who believe. Anyone who believes in Jesus has their hope in Him. Not through what they have done. Not through all these other mechanical things that we've talked about that can never wash away sins any more than the shedding of animal blood ever could. Jesus is our only adequate sacrifice. And the occasion for which we are talking about here this morning, just like Adam and Eve needed the clothing that God provided to be able to stand before Him, so do we need to be covered in the righteousness of Christ. In fact, that's the point I want you to remember as we bring the message to a close this morning. If we are to dress for the occasion, which is ultimately the judgment that we have to stand before God for, what is going to give us access? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So we must put on the righteousness of Christ. In fact, that was the opening hymn that we led with in the service this morning. If you remember verse 4. Caleb, can we get verse 4 of the first song up there? When he shall come with trumpet sound, O may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. I want you to sing that with me, just a cappella, okay? And then we'll sing in the chorus, but it reminds us of this hope. Let's sing. When, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. We must, if we are to stand before God, stand attired in the garments that He provides. And Jesus tells the story of what the consequences will be without it. Matthew chapter 22, verses 11 through 14. He has told the story of a, of a rich man who had invited people to the wedding. And they needed to come with the appropriate garments. But what happened to those who did not? Verse 11 of Matthew 22. When the king came to look at the guests, he saw that there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen question that you must ask yourself here as we close this message is you are you among the ones that can god can call the chosen are you among the ones who have believed how do you know that you are not by feeling some kind of a supernatural tinge i i i think i am because god spoke to no how do we know because those who have believed, those who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ are the ones God has chosen. As many as were appointed unto eternal life, what did it say in the book of Acts? What did they do? They believed. We don't know who God has chosen. But friend, you can know that God has chosen you when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. He will give you the clothes that you cannot supply for yourself.
Don't find yourself on the outside. Find yourself celebrating with the King because He has given you what you could not provide. Thank you, Father, for giving us Your Son. And through the merits of the blood that He shed, we can be clothed in the garments, just like Adam and Eve did, that You provided by Your own hand. They were confronted with the horror of death. They could see the price that was paid so that they could have the covering. They must have known this is what death is like. This is what God said would happen if we disobeyed. But now they could also see that God in His mercy and grace was providing them something that He had not yet foreshadowed before, was giving them life, was giving them hope, was covering their guilt and shame. Lord, help us to remember, too, that is what God has done for us today through Jesus Christ. If there is one here today who needs that covering, we pray, Lord, that they will come in faith believing, trusting in what Christ has done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.